What's up, Defiance? This is Don from Defiant Productions here with Troy. This is our post-Christmas podcast. Today, as we are filming, is uh, December 28th, 2023. Crazy to think that we are a couple of days away from ending 2023. We are about to enter 2024. We've been talking about this for Can't over be. a year. Can't wait for this year to be done. We've been talking about 2024, 2025 as being the bull run um you know, that we're looking for, looking forward to, and here we are on the cusp of it. Remember we made that video and you're talking about the Bitcoin halving, and this was like beginning parts of like, was it 2023? Or I think it was the ending parts of 2022 when things were just so in turmoil. It was probably a year ago. It was probably And, around, and you yeah. anticipated, mm-hmm. and yeah, I mean, you're a veteran in this game, so mm-hmm. you were like, yeah, we believe the beginning parts of the bull will be in 2024, 2025, and it looks like all of 2023, we've just been up only. Mm-hmm. Um, And then we have some really exciting catalysts coming in on 2024, which is the halving event, which we talk about, and the ETFs, which are, what is it, the 5th, the 8th, between the 5th and the 8th? Uh, 6th and the 10th. Okay. 6th and the 10th. Nice. It's good news. Yeah, it is. It's it's crazy to think that we're like literally two weeks away from that. That's, That's a historical moment in history, the Bitcoin ETFs. Yeah, I think we'll look back on that as a catalyst for, um, Six figure Bitcoin. Oh, before we get started, I did want to give you something. Oh boy, a gift. A gift. <laughs> Look at this. Santa Claus is still uh, <laughs> still dropping stuff off three days later, huh? It's a little present. Just rip it open. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Let's show the cameras. Look at that. <laughs> Show Instagram. Look at that. That's awesome. And wear it like Flavor Flav, like the clock. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome, dude. Thank you. You're welcome. Just give me an Ethereum one next year. All right. So, yeah, um, back to the ETF uh, conversation. So, yeah, we, we will look back, I think, as this catalyst for uh, – you know, we, we, we've been talking about the, the potential, the price potential being, you know, six figures, 100,000, 250,000, 500,000, a million dollar Bitcoin, you know, 2030 beyond and all that. And uh, I think this is the catalyst for that first stepping stone that we need to reach to get to those higher figures, which is a hundred thousand dollar Bitcoin, which I think we'll see uh, probably sometime uh, a year out from now, I yeah. think, uh, I think. And I, and I and I use that in quotations think because the ETF is really that big of a game changer that uh, kind of makes a lot of things unknown. I don't know if we necessarily know how the, the markets will react um, price wise. And then once the markets start to react, right, markets react one way. And then what is the sentiment? What is the what is the retail sentiment look like? What is the institutional sentiment look like? And do people start that FOMO earlier than they have normally started it previous cycles? So are we hitting like ridiculous figures in 24 that we normally would be hitting in 25? And then what does 25 look like? So I don't know, man. It's a lot of unknowns. Do you think there could be a potential shorter cycle? You know, like maybe we rock it off before the halving? Because typically, well, every time Bitcoin, is, is it's like four or five months after the halving event, which is in April 2024, do you think there's a potential where we actually break all time highs before that? Like I, that could be. There's so many different scenarios we can think of. Like it's, it's tough. If the cycle, if the cycle follows previous, we should be hitting all time high around uh, November, right, of 24. Yeah. We should, we should, we should be, uh, we should be past 69 in November. If that's like a normal cycle, ETFs make this anything but normal, right? So I see. Okay, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a permable. So when I say this, you have to keep that in mind that I'm, I'm a perma bull. So I think the scenario is much more likely that the cycle extends than is shortened. Okay. Like okay? a super cycle kind of? Yeah. Not to say that that's a guarantee. Not to say that that's definitely going to happen. But I just see a scenario where uh, we have a super cycle type event where it extends then it gets shortened. Not to say that it couldn't get shortened. Like anything is possible in crypto and in Bitcoin. Like Nobody has a crystal ball. Nobody can see the future. So who knows what could happen? But I just think that the the greater likelihood is that we extend. With that being said, um, it's going to be a very interesting summer because the summer, right? The summer, you'll have two things in full swing. You'll have post happening, right? So you'll have the supply shock really take effect because it doesn't take effect that day, right? No. 
Somewhere, somewhere in the middle of April, we'll have the, the supply cut in half. But we don't actually feel that for a little little bit. So, you know, middle of the summer, we'll feel, we'll feel the supply shock. We'll feel that. And then we'll be like right in the middle of all of these ETFs trading in the inflows coming in. So those two events, <coughs> those two events could potentially set up for um, a potential where we get the all-time high maybe then, yeah. right? Um, and then maybe we see six figures by by uh, the normal time that we would see the all-time high in November. But, uh, dude, it's a, there's so many. What I will say is, like, anybody that's telling you what they what they know to, is no going to happen knows. is is just is feeding you a line. Like, yeah. we are just giving you, and I'm just giving you, like, my thoughts on how mm -hmm. I think things could play out. Mm -hmm. It could play out a number of different ways, and I don't I don't think there's anything guaranteed. So right. if you're watching these channels and they're telling and they're putting giving you videos that are telling you that they know what's going to happen and they thumbnail it's something, it's <laughs> all that it is. Like yeah. they they don't nobody knows. That's that's like the biggest risk is just like being sidelined right now. Like if you're if you're sidelined by twenty four, like what are you doing? Like seriously, like I'm looking I'm looking at the sum of the charts right now, and I'm looking at these altcoins, and we got a little bit of a bloody like a lot of these meme coins, not meme coins, these altcoins down 20 percent. And my thought process is we're so early in the cycle, and I just made a tweet about it. If you can't tolerate this stuff, like if you can't tolerate a twenty, because if this was in tradfi. This was the stock market. This was a Apple stock down ten percent. The world's ending. Like yeah, the S and P's down three four percent. Like something's wrong. This is a normal day in crypto, especially when you have a coin like, for example, Metis. I was accumulating this at twenty bucks, and I'm gonna do my victory lap on Solana. Hey, Solana, baby. Jeez, it took been... you ten minutes. I'm surprised <laughs> it took you that long before you jumped in. Nah, and... we're gonna save the victory lap for a little bit. So this Metis coin's a layer two for Ethereum. And this was, I, I was accumulating this like 20, 25 range, and it flew up to 90 bucks in three days. And my thought process is, yes, I can lock in all profits and just rotate them. But <coughs> the thing is, we're too early in the cycle to take big profits. Like right now, I'm taking smaller, like 5%, 10% off the table. And then looking at the market cap, making that, you know, 400 billion or 400 million, this could definitely go to 2 billion. Like, I don't, there's pain in selling too early, too. So, I don't want to get caught in that trap where I'm selling too early, especially on my high conviction narrative plays that I truly believe in. So I'm going to be taking heavy profits in six to 12 months and then rotating them into the granddaddy's Bitcoin, Ethereum. And I was just talking to you about this on our space last night. Uh, and then for the next 18 months, then I'll audit, maybe take fiat profits. Yeah, yeah, that's uh, fiat profits. <laughs> hey, guys, everybody's got bills to pay. Yeah, so... I mean, that's my thought process. Like, if you can't tolerate a 15, 20, 50% pullback on an altcoin, you really don't deserve 200, 500% gains. Because what industry, what, e yeah, what ecosystem can you really get a 200, 500% gain in a week? Like, I, there's nothing. You can't do that in real estate. You can't do that in stocks. Maybe a penny stock, maybe. But that, you know, that's, it's tough, man. It's, yeah, yeah. I mean, we talked last night. I told you, um, you know, I don't. I don't think it's necessarily bad. We 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 defer. We we defer a little bit in regards to like profit taking and stuff like that. Where I think like, if you make a ten x, and you know that's that that's a significant making a ten x in any investment is is like a, a thousand percent is yeah. ridiculous. Like yeah. that's a ridiculous yeah. amount. And I think we're jaded in crypto a little bit, where we're just like, dude, a ten x, dude, there's, this might be a fifty x. You yeah. know what I mean? It's like, if you take profits at a ten x, like there's no shame in that. Like you you did well. Well, the thing about like having a 10x on something, it's not like it's my overall portfolio that did a 10x. Like, th like if I have a hundred thousand dollar portfolio and I put five thousand dollars in something, like I would never put a hundred percent of my portfolio in a coin that could do a 10x. Like, I would love that, but it's it's harder than it is. You, it's all about position sizing and allocation, right? You Let know? me ask you a question. Let's ask it. Ask it. Because when we first started this podcast, yeah. nobody, people may not even know this. Like we right. originally were calling ourselves the Italian Crypto Degens, right? Yes. That was the original name of this podcast yeah. before we changed it to Fine Productions. Would you Would you agree that uh, in order to be in this market, that you need to have a little bit of degeneracy in your DNA in order to in order to operate you, crypto? Yes, absolutely. You have to. Want to for one opt out of the traditional system, so you have to understand True. the system you're engaging in yep. and realize it's fraud. Agreed. It's a, it's a scam. Like, like I tell it to my parents. I'm like, college is like it's a scam. All yeah, right, hundred um, percent. Yeah. So, DJ, you have to like, 
you have to be long term thinking, but also short term thinking. <coughs> like I'm thinking, you know, I I live every day like I'm gonna live a week, but also fifty years. So I kind of like have that median, that golden mean, where I'm like playing it, and I like to take risk. Like I won't say I'm t- a risk taker. Or I would go to the casino and with two grand, I take calculated risks in industries that I really well understand. Um, And that goes back to like my parents or people on the outside telling you to diversify, like buy, buy some stocks, buy some bonds. We already seen that it's all tied to fiat. This is a new emerging technology and this is similar to the early internet days. So I think, I think the RR, which is the risk and reward in this ecosystem is much greater than anything. And I understand it and I see the value in it because you have to see the value in it. You have to have conviction. So yeah, you definitely have to have a little bit of degen. I mean, not completely degen where you blow up your account <coughs> on a meme coin, but like, you know, these are calculated risks. I might be over diversified, but that's fine. I'm, I'm, I have a plan. You know, I have a plan what I'm going to do with everything. So um. I think it's important for people to understand when they're investing, especially when it comes to crypto. Your biggest rewards, your biggest gains are going to come when the majority of the population and people don't believe in what it is you're investing in. Right. Mm-hmm. Because if it was easy, if everybody if everybody believed what you believed, then there would be no 20, 30, 40, 50 X's available to you because everybody would be piling their money in and then the, re- the gains would be lower. Right. That's right. why you see Apple. You know, Apple will go up on a slow trajectory and it will go up 2%. It'll go up 3%. Mm -hmm. You know, it'll drop 2%. It'll drop 3%. We make fun of that, but that's because it's established. Mm -hmm. When something's established and somebody recognizes that it's a good asset, the risk has been removed. There is no risk. Like owning blue chip stocks are is is the least risky thing you can really do in equities, right? Mm -hmm. You own the fang stocks for the most part, like owning those stocks is is like money in the bank. So when you are looking for extreme gains, like people come to crypto looking for, you have to be ready to accept extreme volatility. You have to be ready. You have to be ready to go broke in some of your investments, right? Mm -hmm. Because, like, people think, "Oh, I'm gonna come into crypto, make all this money." Like, that's one of the biggest things. Like, people, "Oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make life changing money, or I'm gonna get rich in crypto." And it's like the the dirty little secret is like 95% of you guys are not gonna do it. Yeah. You're not even going to profit. Right. And yeah, there are some people that might have gotten in super early on some coin and made 20 or 30 grand. And, you know, we'll flout that on their social medias and feel great about that. But I guarantee you, if that same person sat down and did that consistently instead of just that one hit that they hit on, that they're going to lose all that money and then some. They're yeah. just not going to, they're just not going to make it. So this kind of spins into the next uh, conversation that I wanted to have or want us to talk about, which is like when you're, when you're in school. And you're and you're studying and you're young, you know. You look at the guy that's getting good grades and 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 doing very well in school. You, we look at him like, oh, he's a nerd. Like he's he's studying all the time and his grades are really high. Oh, he must be a nerd, right? And it's like because like at least for me, like when I was in school, the stuff that they were teaching me in school, like it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't motivate me to learn it. Like I didn't care about any of that stuff. It wasn't it wasn't in, in, enlightening my brain to be like, oh, I want to learn more about that, right? That didn't happen until I hit adulthood, right? As I as I got into adulthood, like many other people do, and you find the things that you like, now you start to like seek information on that. Like for some people, it's like you know they play fantasy football. That's a good good example to use. If you play fantasy football, those are degens. Well, yeah, yeah, I mean that's for sure. There's some of that, but if you play fantasy sports, like you're spending a lot of the week studying, yeah. uh, you know maybe field conditions or you're studying how somebody is going to react on turf against grass or how somebody played in outdoors against indoors or somebody's done in the last four or five, like you're studying stats, like you're studying things because that is something that you care about, care about. Right. So, and for some people they get like hobbies where they like to do certain things and they start to research that because they like it. Right. So when you're, when you're an adult, you're studying, like, like you look, you look down on people that were studying when they were young that probably got good study habits and then now you're an adult and you didn't study. So like you spend all this time trying to seek information and you don't even know how to properly find the information because you never established those habits when you were younger. You know what I mean? I was thinking about that last night. That's what we started talking about this morning. So it's like as an adult, you should be seeking out the things that like excite you and the things that you uh, are motivated for, whether that's a hobby or if it's something that could bring in maybe some income into your home. Mm-hmm. Like you should be out there studying it. So to bring it back into crypto, like you're not coming in this market 
the same way as you're not going into real estate or equities either. So I don't want to just say it's not, it's just crypto, any investment. You're not stepping into this arena with a bunch of professionals, guys that have been doing this for a while, and you're not going to equate the gains that the professionals yeah. are getting. Just walking in, thinking because you saw something on, you know, the television that said, you know, guy <coughs> X put, you know, a hundred dollars into Shiba Inu and made a million dollars that you're going to do the same thing. Yeah. Or you're going to just find the next coin that's going to hundred X. Like, it takes practice, it takes patience, it takes discipline, it takes losing some money mm. for you to be able to do those types of things. So I say that to get people ready because this thing, this is going to be, because it always is, I say this because I, I know with, with like 95% confidence, probably 100, but I'll just, I, nothing's 100. This will be the biggest cycle we've ever seen because mm. 13 was big, 17 was bigger than 13, 20 was bigger than 17, so 24 on will be bigger than 20 and 21, and we can all agree 20 and 21 was pretty damn big. Like really going from 3,000, well, going from 3,000. What about the law of di diminishing returns? Even if the returns diminish, the numbers will still be higher. Yeah. From 3,000 to 69, now we go from 15,000 to, to post 100K mm -hmm. for Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. But then there's some coin right now that neither one of us even know about that will probably be the biggest performing coin of this cycle. Some ridiculous meme coin or some ridiculous like mm -hmm. project that probably ends up rugging, right? Yeah. Will be the biggest coin that everybody talks about in 2025, 2026. And that goes into like the, the Solana victory lap I had, like buying this at nine bucks, having three months to accumulate this between 20 and 30, and then it ripping to 124, and then I'm posting screenshots of like the, the price going up, you know, within the last nine weeks. And people see like, you know, a thousand percent return, but they don't see like all the, all the pain and suffering, all the losses, everything that got me to a point where I know how to have a keen eye to identify this potential, identify an oversold crypto company that you know just happened after FTX, bought, bought FTX's di distressed assets. <coughs> I, like they had a bunch of Solana on their balance sheet. They went bankrupt. You buy their distressed Solana assets. Solana was dead. That's dead. a great example. So dead. I told you, you bought it, and I told you that shit is dead. Dead. You bought it and you texted me and I told you, bro, that that's that's dead. I remember that's I was, a dead I project. Was, I was Instacarting and, and you, I, I was like, holy shit! I had people text me like, yo, should I buy this? It was like nine because only dipped down to nine bucks for a little bit, so you can only buy it at nine for a few like hours. But then it went up to twelve, and I, and I was like, holy shit! Like every paycheck, I put everything in it. So I I was highly convicted, high, highly conviction. And I doubled down on it, and I was investing ninety percent of my income into that one coin, and then it so just that's it, the people need to understand. Like people are, you're, they're seeing like your your victory lap now. They're seeing like it got up to one hundred and twenty dollars right around Christmas, yeah. right? And if you bought it at nine bucks, which you did, yeah. you did buy it at nine bucks, but in order to do that, you had to. You had to go against the entire wave of people, myself included. My stomach, I, dude. I told you when you were buying it that it was. I told you FTX is failing. I told you I messaged that you. coin is tied to FTX. It's not going to survive. I didn't see any path yeah. for survival, and somehow by the grace of God, this coin survived. And then here we are. You know what I'm saying? So, I got to <laughs> you have to remember. Yeah, I and I I've, I've been telling you all along. Like you, you can tell the people I've been giving you I've been giving you props for that one. I told yeah. you I was way wrong. You were right. Yeah. Again, that I don't shit coin, so I didn't. I, I don't. I don't. I would have never. Even if, even if I did shit coin, I wouldn't have bought it. Yeah. Right? I, w I wasn't buying it. Dude, so it's sick. you were. You but were the right. thing is, you never used Solana. You never like created a Soul Flare wallet, which is like a MetaMask for the Solana ecosystem. You, like they're gaming on it. Like it's just like I know gaming is gonna be a huge narrative, and it's just like they have DeFi. They have way better gaming than a, like Ethereum. Like I was like, and they got the Solana phones coming out. I was like, this is this is sick. And it's like I watch. I remember Kevin O'Leary said something about if you really want to make wealth in finance, buy distressed assets from companies that go bankrupt. And then, you know, and they got, they got to be highly like fundamentally good companies. And I was like, holy shit, like they, this is like the definition of a good fundamentals. They got decent tokenomics. They got sick developers. The CEO is humble as shit, like super humble. And I was like, you know, it might be a little bit more centralized. A lot of it is funded by VCs. <coughs> A lot of VC venture capitalists, you know, owned a big portion of it. But as soon as that thing dumped, dude, it, the, the tokenomics got better. It, came, it got a little bit more decentralized, meaning it was less owned by VCs and it was more available to the public. And I was like, you know what? What do I got to lose? Like my portfolio, like Bitcoin's at that. I think Bitcoin at that time was around 15, 20 K. It was, K. To, it was yeah. just like, what do I got to lose? Like I, I, if, it, if this doesn't work out, I'm going to be working a nine to five the rest of my life either way. It's like, take the risk and, you know, 
take take a calculated risk. You know, don't take stupid risks. And you know, I'm still holding this. And like, you know, it's at like I think it's at ninety right now. So it's like I'm down. Like, let's see, Solana is at one hundred. So it's down. But like, anything over a hundred, it's like a pipe dream. It's like a cherry on top. Like, I'm fine. I'm fine with a hundred. And I'm actually gonna start. If it gets under a hundred, I'm gonna buy more of this. Cause like the best <laughs> plays are the ones that pump early on in the bull. So like Solana and Metis Injective, these are the winners of the bull run because the smart money are buying this. We see the all these altcoins, the weekly close on the candles broke above the 600-day moving average. Like this is so early to be taking all like 100% profits in these coins, like 10, 20% at max, and then leave the rest to ride because like I said, there's pain in selling too early. There's pain in selling too late. But it hurt. But it hurt, it does hurt more to sell too late than too early. But again, you got to understand the zoom out and know where you are in the cycle. We're too early to be taking big, heavy profits right now, especially in these altcoins. To spin it back to you know my 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 bag, which is Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin maxis. Yeah, you know this is a lot of Solana talk. Like I, I but we got to get back to Bitcoin. <laughs> 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 so people need to understand, and and again, like. Anybody that's been following me for any sort of time, which would be like, you know, friends, my thousand friends that I have followers or whatever I have on, on, on I wonder Facebook. how many people honestly unfriended you because of how much Bitcoin you talk. Oh, I definitely been muted. hundred uh, percent. Today on Facebook today, I woke up and the thing that popped up on my uh, feed. Uh, what's it called when they show you the stuff that, that the old stuff that came up? What is that called? Um, it's like a. Uh, Times time lap. something time, time lap. Hop it shows time, yeah. yeah. Time hop, yeah. So something came up from seven years ago that I yeah. posted December twenty eighth seven years ago, yeah. and it was a nine hundred and ninety five dollar Bitcoin. And they probably sick to your their stomach. It was it's it like, was like who's this crazy I was guy posting talking Bitcoin? It, <laughs> I was posting it because Bitcoin was about to go four. That's figures. my Solana moment though. Bitcoin was about to go four figures for mm. the first time, yeah. right? So I posted that, and um, you know, I, I say that because. Uh, people like me are 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 the few and far between at you know three thousand dollar bitcoin or fifteen thousand dollar bitcoin or when bitcoin goes from sixty four thousand to thirty thousand overnight and drops fifty percent like few and far between can you find people that are just like yeah dude keep buying like mm -hmm. this is the this is when you do it like yeah. the days that are really red this is when you buy oh today right now so yeah. When when Bitcoin and I say this because like we are getting we just we just started this whole podcast by talking about like bit 100k Bitcoin is like in our like in our front mirror like we can see it we're, we're traveling oh, towards we're, it right yeah. we're traveling towards oh, it so we 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 it's in our it's in our eyesight there, now dude. it's in our eyesight so we're not there yet but I I believe like we're getting close to the time where we'll see it sometime in the next 12 months we'll see a hundred thousand dollars Bitcoin and when that happens when that happens. An overwhelming majority of the population will 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 have something to say about people like me, or, yeah. or people like you, or whoever at that point in time has any They're significant lucky. has any significant amount of Bitcoin. They got lucky, and and that and they'll be saying stuff like that. It'll just be like, oh well, you know, you you got in real early, like you you knew that it's it's just like, dude, like this is not a, a, a like a. Uh, a ride that just goes in a straight line that's yeah. just like real comfortable you put the shades on and you just relax bro yeah. this, oh, is this is a bumpy dude my blood pressure my turbulent going gray like, like the, the plane looks like it's crashing into oh a mountain and then it swerves this is the most like, stressful job ever dude so it's not it's not just one direction like you have to have absolute complete conviction to hold this to hold this asset you have to just know that this is like i say and i don't just say it like i live it i believe it and my portfolio will show it that this is the greatest asset that what we have ever seen in my lifetime and probably uh -huh. riches in my parents lifetime it's the best asset and i am at the oh, cusp no. i am at the cusp of being in a po in a position to be able to own this asset accumulate this asset the same way that uh uh corporation like BlackRock, a company like MicroStrategy, or, you know, if Elon Musk wants to go and buy billions of dollars worth, like I have the same opportunity as them to get this asset. Whereas all these other really good assets, unless I'm an accredited investor, I will never see those yes. assets. Because we're front running. Never see those assets. This is the only asset in our entire lifetime where we're, we're, we are front running the big dogs. 
Michael Saylor, who I often talk about, I quote often on this podcast, and he's probably the, the next to Andreas Antonopoulos, the most videos Bitcoin related that I've watched. He just purchased another 35, 40,000. 15 million? Another close to like 40,000 Bitcoin or some. So, or no, I'm sorry. No, no. It wasn't 40,000. In the last three months, this is what I'm trying to say. Let me backtrack. I, I got ahead of myself. In the last three months of his purchases, he's purchased close to 40,000 Bitcoin in the last three months. Okay. 2040 is going to be 16 years away from a couple of days from now. 16 years, right? Yeah. Not that. It's, it's, that's more. That's that's less of a gap than we're, we're about that. We're, than we're less. It's less. It's less of a gap between me and you. Yeah. Right. Our age yeah. yeah. So, sixteen years, 20, 20, 40, from twenty forty until twenty forty four, the entire amount of Bitcoin that will be mined will be less than the amount of Bitcoin Michael Saylor just bought in the last three months. That's crazy. That's the amount of Bitcoin that'll be released in the that's market so in that four year span in sixteen years. So if this thing doesn't die, and it hasn't died, it's only been the best asset in the last decade plus. So if this thing continues to grow, continues to grow, gets the institutional adoption that we're all going to be seeing in a couple of weeks, and that continues to grow, and people continue to pile in, and people continue to look at Bitcoin like they look at Monet paintings, like, like, like they look at real estate that's prime in you know Fifth Avenue, Manhattan, that you've heard me talk about many times before. If people keep looking at this as that store of value, then eventually when we get to 2040, there is going to be no coins to get. Whoever's got them has them. And the only way you get them is if you're lucky enough to be related to somebody that passes them down to you. <clears throat> so we say like time is running out and time is really running out because that's how the protocol is set up. You don't have these opportunities to get Bitcoin forever. In three months, it cuts in half. In 2028, it cuts in half again. 2032 cuts in half again. 2036 cuts in half again. And then we're at 2040, what I just told you. So like your opportunity, and then the other thing you have to remember is like the USD value of what you can get is going to increase as well. So the amount of Satoshis that your $100 is going to be able to buy or your $1,000 will be able to buy is going to be less and less and less and less. So your piece of the pie will be less and less and less and less. I want to, I, I'm going to end this thought on one thing. To really like drive home the scarcity aspect of Bitcoin. Take all the zeros away. Take all the zeros away of the population and of Bitcoin. What we're dealing with is the equivalent of 8,000 people fighting over 21 of Bitcoin. So say it one more time. 8, Take the zeros away. Take the zeros off 21 million. Take the zeros off 8 billion. You have 21 of these things. Let's just pretend this represents one Bitcoin. So there's 21 of these on the table. And you got 8,000 people in the room coming to get it. 8,000 people are fighting over 21 of those. That's it. Once the world recognizes what we already know and what the institutions are about to tell you, right? Because the institutions, they, they, like guys like me and influencers like us are only a, like we're nothing. Even the biggest guys in our space that have a million followers are nothing. They are nothing. When, when somebody like BlackRock, like Larry Fink or like Paul Tudor Jones or the big dogs in finance are like, this is the greatest asset that's ever been created and this is where BlackRock is holding their funds. And everybody's like, oh, oh, shit. I need to get some of that. How do I get that? Don, what do I, what, what? And then we're just like, we try to tell you. Like, I know. Yes. Yep. Yeah. I know. You should. Yep. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. No, you can't have mine. No. <laughs> no. No, I'm not, I'm not taking. Nope. Sorry. No. Sorry, you know what man. I mean? So, like, that's that's what this is all about. Like, that's the that's the conversations. And, and. I love that we're that we're videoing all this. I love that we're going to have this library of content. I love that we're doing this podcast because I really like days like today when on my news feed something pops up from seven years ago and I see that like I was here before a thousand mm -hmm. and I can be reminded of yeah. like yeah dude like I front ran I front ran all this, you know what I'm saying? I got here before BlackRock got here. I got here before like Wall Street started saying because I'm gonna I'm gonna like relish the moment when like. Guys besides Michael Saylor, like big wigs are like talking how Michael Saylor talks. And you see some of these other corporations start putting it on their balance sheets. You think you think Saylor and MicroStrategy are going to be the only ones that do this? Like Saylor, Saylor's got like eight or nine billion dollars worth of Bitcoin on their balance sheets. Right. Mm. So as Bitcoin goes up, like they're exponentially beating inflation. Like all the money that Apple and Berkshire Hathaway has on their balance sheets that's just sitting in cash, getting four or five percent in the bank, 
pales in comparison to what Michael Saylor has been doing. Mm-hmm. He's going to be the Batman of this this world. He will be. <laughs> he will be at some point in the next ten years. He owns less one percent of the supply, right? Um. He so he has a hundred a shade under one hundred ninety thousand Bitcoin right now. So, in the overall twenty one million market cap he's just a shade under one percent but we've talked about the fact that there's probably between three and possibly five million coins lost forever Mm -hmm. so when you factor that in he owns over one person probably about a 1.4 1.3 1.4 percent of the supply that we know still exists that people can still get that's basically saying like let's say there's a fixed amount of u.s dollars (coughs) oh okay (laughs) let's say um there's a fixed amount of U.S. dollars. Basically, there's twenty trillion dollars. Basically, this man owns two percent of all the money supply in the world. He's gonna he's gonna have a lineage of wealth. Um, that's he, a crazy. Yeah, he'll be he'll be uh, my kids' generations. Uh, like you know, we what do we say Bill Gates. Now we say Elon Musk, like the richest yeah. guys. Like my kids will look at Michael Saylor. Like he'll be the. I think. And I could be wrong on this one, but I think he'll be the the first trillionaire. Yeah, I mean, I mean I'm sure there's already trillionaires, just not dude, public, dude. No, really, no, because I think the biggest worldwide company is Saudi Aramco. I think they're worth like um, the whole company itself is worth like three or four trillion. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know because I think Apple's worth like two trillion, and the Saudi Aramco is like the biggest company. And I don't think <laughs> one person has fifty uh, percent of Saudi Aramco. Yeah. I got a question. Do you think, and this ties into some AI talk? Do, do you think Bitcoin ties into AI, or will be will play a big part of AI and like, you know, these robots like that Elon's creating? Do you think this is the metaverse? Do you think this will play a big role in it? Because I I know you had a dream about AI or something. Do Do you want to dive into that? Well, or yeah. That the, the 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 I was thinking just about how like AI will change uh, education if they if they really want to. The, it, this this needs there needs to be an important piece where people need to be genuinely like good actors in the education space, which I believe doesn't exist right now. Mm-hmm. I don't think the people that control education really give a shit right now. I think it's just I mean we we see a model that hasn't changed in decades. <coughs> K through twelve models the same. They've made a little tweaks here and there, but overwhelmingly our kids just graduate without necessary life skills to succeed. So I don't think there's good actors right now. Mm-hmm. But if sometime in the future we do get good actors in education and things do change, I think that implementing an AI feature, because when you're when you're in school, right, you're you're forced to like memorize and learn things like we just talked about at the beginning, like stuff that you don't really care about. Like I don't give a shit who the 10, 13, 14, 15th president was. I don't give a shit about some damn Louisiana purchase that happened years ago that like really doesn't affect much. I don't care about this math, A plus B plus Y equals who gives a shit. You know what I mean? Like a lot of this stuff that I'm never going to use in my life is just like worthless. Like it just shows that, yeah, I can memorize something and you see I can memorize it and then we move on to something else and I'll never remember that ever again in my life. So I was thinking about like AI and the, and the effect where there's some sort of AI bot or, or, or model that figures out kids' interests specifically in regards to things that they learn and focuses on their interests and sees how well that they can learn those interests Mm -hmm. and then fosters that into grades and then allows you to advance through school, figuring out what it is that associates with like life. Like obviously just like, Oh, I like to play Fortnite, So it's like, not that, but like things that have to do with like real life that come into like an education model that kids would be, would be more prone to study and learn that would pique their interest right yeah that would hold on to them and then they could show as they and i think this is more appropriate like middle school on maybe as you get into high school this would this model would work perfect for high school not for a second or third like there's basic things that they still need to be taught to get them ready but like when you hit high school like i remember i remember being in ninth grade right I, i'll give you my experience 1992 sitting in ninth grade in my counselor's office and they're just like uh you have to pick like a major like we had to do majors yeah and i literally said what's the easiest shit i can pick like what are, what are my options here? Math? No, 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 thank you. Right? Social studies? Yeah, p- miss me on that shit. Right? And we got down the line to like business. I'm like business. Oh, that's the money. Oh, yeah, I'll do those ones. What are those things? Those uh, account? Yep, yep. I'll sign up for those. Give me those ones. Give me those ones. Right? 
So then I, of course, because I wasn't the greatest of students, like I wasn't dumb, but I just like, I was a procrastinator. Yeah. We waited till 11th and 12th grade to take all those elective classes, right? So then I took those and it was like, all right, we did some money things, like having some conversations and then, but it was like, it was kind of ridiculous. Like, mm -hmm. and then I didn't even go to school for business. Yeah. So like what, complete waste of time, like a complete waste of time. Waste of time. So if there was some sort of AI model that was available that could have figured out and peaked in my brain and maybe even like been a catalyst to think about what I would do for the rest of my life. And then I could prove that I could learn this thing that's interests me and show them that I'm not a dumbass and get good grades on that. And then catapult me into like the next phase of my life to like go to school or, or go to some, some, some trade school that would, uh, uh help foster whatever they found was, we'd be a much better off society. Well, you would save a lot of time. You'd save a lot of money. You know what? You know Which is why I believe it will never what happen. What about all the people that do like four or five different degrees, then finally find out what they want to do? You know what I mean? It's just like a waste of time, waste of money, like waste of resources. There's bad actors in education. I just don't yeah. – we have to remove so many bad actors for this to ever be a reality. The, the institutions, like we're, – we're, I don't want to get political, so I, I don't. I want to tread lightly on this on what I'm going to say here because I don't want to. I don't want to get into anything about how I feel about the specific topic. Bill Ackman, billion dollar investor, right? Yep. He's going at it with Harvard because <clears throat> Harvard is his alma mater, and he feels some type of way about the alma the the Harvard president who spoke in front of Congress and said some things in regards to the Israel Palestine stuff that he did not like, right? He didn't like it. And he doesn't like how Harvard is reacting to that. So he's deciding that I'm just not going to be funding any of your, uh, there's no endowment coming from Bill Ackman because of all this stuff, right? And it's like, he's free to do that. It's an open market and I get all that. And it's not necessarily about the scenario or about that. It's just like a, a, a little peek into the window of like this billionaire is giving all this money to Harvard, all this money to Harvard, right? Mm. And they're still like, charging you astronomical amounts of money to attend this school mm -hmm. just so you can show somebody on your certificate that it says Harvard. And it's like, it probably costs five or six times more than it did in the eighties and nineties to attend Harvard. Right. Is it that much better of a degree? And they're getting all this money from all these billionaires because these guys graduate, they get money and they give it back to the school. So it's like, who's getting rich here? Like where's all this money? It's not, I mean, there, for every like Bill Ackman that comes out of Harvard and these smart guys, like there's guys that drop out of school from Harvard and they don't start Facebook. They're not Mark Zuckerberg and they don't get still become billionaires. Like they might leave a year or two out of school and they realize that Harvard ain't for me. And Harvard doesn't give a shit. Harvard just they'll take you because they believe that you have a chance to make it. But when you leave Harvard without a degree, you're leaving with six figures of debt and Harvard don't give a shit about you. Yeah. They got your money. See ya. And that's Harvard. <laughs> That's not SUNY Buffalo. That's not SUNY Brockport. That's not like the littler schools yeah. that aren't charging six figures a year, but might charge like, I don't even know what it costs to go to those schools. Well, maybe it's like 30 or 40,000 yeah, a year. NU is pretty expensive. It's like 40 grand. So yeah, you go to NU and you, and you realize after junior year, I can't make it, right? Yeah. You're, you're 90,000 in debt with no degree. Good luck starting that life, right? Now you have no degree to, to, to earn. On. It's just like the whole model is And even if you ridiculous. have the degree, your income isn't – like I know people that have a four-year degree in business and finance, and they're I, – I can make more off Instacart. Like I can literally DoorDash more, like, and I own my time. I, and I work less hours. And I can take lunch breaks whenever I want. It's just – <laughs> we have technology. I don't think the educational system Jordan, adapts. Jordan said Harvard is a brand like Nike. I can see that he just he just okay. wrote on there. Harvard is a brand like Nike. Yeah, well, I don't, yeah. I, I mean, don't. I really I, I don't disagree with that. I think like uh, you know these colleges these colleges are just big corporations, man. Like yeah. the the only people I have arguments with, the only people I have arguments with that disagree with how I feel about college, the only people, only people that disagree with my takes on college, mm -hmm. work for a college, in some sort yeah. of capacity. They're either a professor or they're in the uh, enrollment office or they have some sort of like financial tie to the organization, which I, 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 I understand. I kind of get it. Yeah. <coughs> but those are the only people that really will disagree with me because I'm, I'm talking about their livelihood. So I understand that. But like most normal logical people realize that coming out of college with $200,000 in debt in this economy here is completely asinine. Oh. It ain't worth it. Yeah. You could, if tomorrow you told me, even if I had like 
two, three million dollars of net worth. If you told me tomorrow, Don, write me a check for two hundred thousand, and I will give you a degree from Harvard, and we'll make it all look like you graduated from Harvard. I would tell you, GFY. What's GFY stand for? Try not to say the F word. Try to fit. <laughs> yeah. GFY. What is that? Go, 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 go! Blank yourself. Oh, okay. Right. <laughs> so, like, I I got a I got a bachelor's degree. I got a master's degree. I don't use either. I mean, I I I've used them to to get me into certain jobs, yeah. but I, the the degrees that I have in education, I haven't used since two thousand and eight. I'm, if you apply to a job and you say you have a four-year degree, do they really check? Like, I have never applied to a real job, and I got my four-year degree in finance on you, and I still haven't even gotten it in the mail. Like, I, I call them. Well, I'm your like, transcripts are what they would – they wouldn't need the degree per se because you can fake that. Yeah. It's the transcripts that yeah. are really well, – the say, official transcripts you know, that like, they would need. You know, every once in a while I think, like, how much money I spend on you, and I'll be, hey, you mind uh, just shipping me my piece of paper? And then I'm talking to some like student in the office, and, and then I never see anything. I've joked numerous <laughs> times, like when somebody has seen my, ma- I'm like, you want to buy this? Like I'll sell it to you, my master's. You just yeah. Blot out Don and put it whatever you want. Well, I'm sure there's <laughs> other Don Rinaldi's out there. Yeah, so I mean, like it's the transcripts that really. I don't matter. know one Troy Pullman. Not the degree, not the degree. Dude, those are these notifications. Awesome. Yeah, that was a good good uh, subject into into a little bit of schooling and, and i'm sure somebody got pissed out there that has a has a job with like one of the local colleges i'll chime in because i worked in education for 31 years and i have two kids that just graduated from college uh with no debt because they made good decisions so they went to two good universities canisius college university now and ub and graduated with no debt partially because you know they had some family support but also because they just went to colleges. They didn't need to live on campus and have a party <coughs> party house. I said, you know what? You can go out and party. You can go out on the weekends and not have to spend eight to $10,000 yeah. on housing. Like, that's just stupid. Um, but but they did get both get jobs with, you know, kind of related to the Once very specific related to his degree. Um, and they did, both of them were asked to like Xerox their diplomas and show them diplomas. But I've tried to say to them, is that a lot of kids in high school are very focused on their grades because mom and dad are like helicopter parents and you got to like this, 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 and this. Then they get to college and they still do that and they're afraid to change their major and their trade because they're stuck in this concept of what high school education was like, that you know it's all about getting on the honor roll and all that crap and a gold star and all that shit. And then they get to college and nobody cares. And, and my buddy is a smart dude, went to a really good university, played rugby, drank all the time, and he's like, man, C's get degrees, and he makes more money than most of my, my friends, and he's just a hardworking guy. He's not the smartest guy, he'll tell you that, but he just works hard. He shows up, he knows how to show up at work, he knows how to play those games, and he said, <laughs> no one has asked me for like my GPA or anything. He goes, and thank God my first job, they didn't ask me for my GPA. He says, because it was shit. He goes, but I got a piece of paper and it's that ticket to get on the train. You know what? And and that's all it is. He says, and that's what I've told my sons. I'm like, I don't, no one's ever going to ask you for that diploma ever again, because now you've got that first job. So that, that piece of paper helps you get that first job. And if you want to have that traditional, I don't even want to say it's traditional, but if you just want to get into a place where they're going to require you, when you're not your own boss, if you, you need to have that, maybe that piece of paper. But I'll tell you, like, I got friends and work in personnel, and it really, they get that occasional Ivy League guy that comes across their table and or girl, and they're like, they walk in like, and, and I've heard this from several friends that work in human resources type departments, and they're always like, these guys walk in and they just think they should get the job because they've got this piece of paper. And quite often they don't hire those people anymore because they also say, these people aren't making good decisions about their own financing. They've got $200,000 worth of debt where the guy from UB or, you know, Canisius is coming in with like no debt. Yeah. And, and they seem to be a harder worker. Like it, it's, it's, it, but like you said, it's like your one friend posted on there. It, it, people want that Nike brand. They want that swoosh. Yeah. They you, want the brand. you brought up a good point, and I and I want you when you're when you're free later on to look this up because there are studies that are being done that this again will piss people off that went to school, but it's true if you look it up. They're they're studying this stuff. C students overwhelmingly make better employees than A students, and that's because what they what they found is the C students, like you just said, don't walk into a job thinking anybody owes them anything. 
they realize quickly that the only way I'm going to stand out is effort. And the A student walks in and says, my effort was in school. I already showed you what I can do. I'm going to come in and just, you should just pay me because I have these A, a grades. Where the C guy's like, I got to earn everything I get. And the A guy comes in thinking, I owe, I'm owed something. Wow. That's, yeah. That's... Yeah. So mom and dad getting those C's in college wasn't such a bad idea. <laughs> Tony Poli, what up? You and, it, it? and admittedly, I was that parent when my kids were in high school. I was like, man, you got to get those things, blah, blah, blah. And then I, but I, I'm very proud of the fact that once they got to college, I have no idea what my kids' GPAs were. No concept whatsoever. And I told them point blank because I helped them with money when I could. And they did some of it themselves. So it was a nice balance. And I told them when the one, one of them had a bad semester. And I said, okay. And he told me he had the bad semester. He was miserable in the major, so he switched to majors, and he kind of fell apart a little bit. And I said, okay. I said, here's my – but I'm going to tell you, like, you know, like if you want my help on these things, we're kind of done unless you, you show me that you value the money that I'm helping you with. Yeah. Yeah. And that was kind of like – and that was a good wake-up call for them to say, like, I, you know, there's nothing since I have to help you. I mean, you can go out and get – and they both worked, and they both paid for their, their fair share – but you're right. Like it's they. It's definitely there's definitely that aspect of like, you you you, like, like my buddy, <laughs> my one buddy works in corporate, and he's really funny. He's like people, they know what they they think they're entitled to things that employers don't necessarily give a shit about. Yeah. So like he never dress like it's a stupid little thing. He's like I never do I never do dress down Friday because I just don't do it. He says because like I don't know. He's like. I'm, I'm the boss. I should I should look the part. And he just knows he's learned how to again. He's the C student dude. And he was like he and he's done very, very well for himself. But it's really funny. He doesn't own a big and freaking big house. He's like uh, he doesn't. He just like never he's get degrees. He, he's like he goes, I want like I want a nice couch. <laughs> and he goes, I but I want to have experiences. I want to go skiing on the weekends. I'm not I don't need to show off like so yeah. he's great. I, I he's one of my favorite dudes because you never, never know that he was doing as he's as financially <laughs> successful as he is because it's all about moderation. And he wants that, you know, he wants that. He wants to be able to leave at a reasonable. He doesn't want to have to work till he's 70. He wants to walk out when his wife walks out of her career and, and then have experiences. So they're like, we don't need like a 400,000 square house, you know, for, for whatever. Like it's, I don't know, like I, I think all of this ties back to the education that we're, we're, we're telling these kids, um, to follow this system that's that our grandparents and our parents followed. Yeah. Follow, go to the education, buy the big house. Like we keep doing all. It's not just education. It's not just finance. It's everything. Like sorry, I went up on a crazy rant there, but like I mean, I look at it and I've learned so much talking to you guys, younger people that I know that are like your age, Troy. That are like, man, I can't afford a house. And it's really changed my perspective on like a lot of the things that we're doing wrong to the young people in this country. So. To tie all that up, and I, and I want to I want to give my parents some credit here too, because like, you know, they they encouraged me to go to college. They encouraged me to go to school. And um, at 18 years old, when I was making those, t I mean, when you're 18, you're, you don't know what you're you don't know what you're doing with your life. Like you're you think you know what you're doing, but you don't know. And even like when I graduated college at 22, like you still don't know you don't know anything, right? But the the value that that education, college in particular, does does provide i think and this is where the grades become like irrelevant in my eyes right i think it's important in high school like i'll encourage my son to get the highest possible grades that he can only because if he does take the route of college even though i really don't want him to it'll be an easier path if your grades are good it's just an easier path like you get you get afforded opportunities that you don't if you're a c student so that that is true but once you get to college man the really the only thing that matters is that you can show an employer I can start something and I can finish it. If I got a 75 or I got a 95, when I'm 35 years old grinding for your company, does it really matter, right? Does it matter if I had a 75 in college or I had a 95 in college, if I'm providing value to your company and I'm a good employee? Because I, I was able, just like the guy that got the 95, I started and I finished. And that's what it provides. It provides you an ability to show someone I can start something at 18 years old 
And then sometime in my 20s, I can finish that thing and come out with this piece of paper and show an employer, I'm ready to go. Let's get let's get cracking. And recognize that all the shit I just learned, I'm probably never going to use. The only thing I'm bringing to you is showing you that I can be an employee, even though I'd rather my kid be an entrepreneur than an employee. But if you're working for a company, that's what you're doing. Clearly, like, to, to, par- to, to just... <clears throat> There are certain things that the college is important. If you want to be a doctor, yes. Like there are certain things yeah, that you, right. like, so we're not yeah. saying every major, but there's a, you talked about it earlier. Like there's, there's just too many majors that like, what is that major? <laughs> and everybody goes and gets these specialized majors because the colleges it's marketing. Yeah. Like, look how cool these versions of the sneakers are. Like this one has red laces. Like, and what that is, is that's those silly majors that I can't tell you how many of my friends that have gone to school and gone out of college, come out with like some obscure major and they're like, but there's no jobs in it. And yeah, and, and then that actually hurts them. They said, I would have been better off getting a generic business administration degree than like international focus on warehousing. Like yeah. there's, there's goofy degrees like yeah, that, yeah. but like that doesn't, they, you're better off getting a generic degree mm-hmm. that you can apply to a ton of different things as opposed to yeah. like this real specific, but the colleges market it because you got a cool lab that somebody donated, you know, it, it's just silly yeah. stuff. Like it's just, it's just funny. Like it's just, it is definitely funny. Like half my junior year. In my entire senior year is all I needed to get a, a teaching degree. The rest of it was a waste of time. And anybody that tells you anything different, like, oh, you need these electives to, to make you a well, like, no, dude, that's a money grab. Like, I needed, I they needed have to justify six, it to keep you there. For I four needed years. about six classes yeah. to learn how to be a teacher. Like, if they come up with some program where you just do a, a year and a half crash course to learn how to be a teacher, it'll be just as valuable, if not more valuable, than the four years I spent getting my undergrad in teaching. It's a complete money grab waste of time. Looking back at it, I really only needed the second half of my junior year and all of my senior year to learn how to be a teacher. The first, all my freshman year, all of my sophomore year, and half of my junior year was just a complete waste of time. Another thing I got to add to that is. The education might not be great, or it may be great, but the connections I got were, like, priceless. You know what I mean? That's one thing. Like, you meet someone at Harvard, you start a business with them, like, you're yeah. getting a lot of value from that. Sure. And I can't even name how many – I got one of my best friends I met at NU, um, my ex-girlfriend, met, like, through friends. and Like, business – like, one of my mentors I met at NU, and, you know, that's that's priceless. So, like, I, yeah, I paid, you know, forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 for my degree, but <laughs> – that relationship I built is is priceless. So that that's some now, value. Now you can jump on X and make the same relationships. Now you can jump on Twitter, which is for, well X, which is formerly known as Twitter, and you can jump into space and you can find you know connections and networks that way. So so, so like twenty five years ago when I there's went something to college, about that face to face interaction though. Come on now. I mean, you can go meet a, meet them up at a conference. Like it's it. it True. It, yeah, yeah. I, do you really got to go spend a hundred thousand dollars to no. like make friends? Like it's not. It's I understand what you're saying, yeah. and like that's more relevant for me in ninety. Six when I, I know, went to but college. now we got these smart. Well, but in 2030, when my kids go into college and they're like, we're talking about that, it's like, yeah. dude, like, no, like that ain't it. Yeah, that spaces are it. highly valuable. We we had well, we had this lady come on yeah uh, last night yeah, and she was talking about energy and you know Bitcoin mining and stuff and she she's from Texas and she she's very knowledgeable in her in her expertise and. So, you know, that's a group. We'd love to have her on our podcast. Yeah, and, you know. I, I uh, X tokens will shout her out if she ends up watching this. I don't know if she fo- ended up following us or not. Uh, I told her about our YouTube channel, but I asked if she would like to come on to be interviewed, and she said, Yeah, so that'd be really cool. But like I, I told you, <clears throat> after we I ended the spaces and we were messaging back and forth, like it's very rare for me to like sit back and just listen to somebody talk for a while and actually learn something in yeah. the space. And last night was one of those rare options because she worked in uh, a, a uh, the electrical side, like, like a power authority, like working yeah. behind the scenes. And she was like telling us about how, like, it, like we, we talk about this in our house all the time about leaving lights on and like wasting energy and stuff like that. And it's like, you're not really wasting energy. It's like so much of the energy that's created doesn't even make it to like, it's, it's lost all along the way from when it comes from that power plant to your house and you're paying for the energy that you don't even get. Yeah. It's wild. Like it's so all she, wild. And, and she said something about actually keeping your lights off is wasting yeah yeah so like not using your energy is actually is actually like not really that much different than if you left them all on yeah doesn't really have that huge of a difference right in uh in your bills and stuff like that yeah. and, how, and the energy that's uh that was great and then we talked about because i because i had a little bit of knowledge about how these operations are happening in texas which she's down down there and how some of these mining facilities are using that. And again, it goes back to the ESG narrative that we've talked about before, where people are saying Bitcoin is so bad for the environment. 
But it's like a lot of the mining that's happening is using the energy that's wasted, that's already created by these power plants all across the, the, the globe, that the energy is just getting emitted and wasted. And these, what, it's, what she said is happening is these Bitcoin facilities are going along the lines of where the power is going and where it's getting wasted and emitted and setting up shop there, taking that energy that would have already been emitted and using it to mine Bitcoin. Yeah. So it's actually taking away from what's going into the atmosphere and using it to, to mine Bitcoin, yeah. which a lot of people don't realize and don't yeah, know. And, and, you know, she talked about narratives and in that, you know, uh, people are using the uh, misunderstanding of how Bitcoin mining works and the under misunderstanding of how the electrical grid and all that stuff works and playing those two against each other and creating this narrative that doesn't really exist. I yeah. thought it was really good. Again, another reason why, you know, that space is an access. Maybe point. next podcast we can have her on because that would, I, we can talk about how much energy the TradFi uses in Bank of America. Yeah. So that would yeah. be, you know, we're coming up to the end of the podcast, so that would take a long time. But token of the week, Bitcoin. Or uh, Don, sorry, I called him. Your new nickname should just be Bitcoin. What's the token of the week? Bitcoin. Bitcoin. <laughs> token of the week is Metis. M E T I S L two layer two for Ethereum scaling solution. Metis. Well, I do have to say, Metis is outperforming Bitcoin in the weekly. Okay. He. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, so we'll wrap this up here. Do you have any last minute thoughts before we we do our closing thoughts? Um. Don't trust verify. Get ready. Um, position yourself if you haven't already. Get, um, you get, got you got a little bit of time. You have probably two weeks before this ETF thing gets approved. We'll probably see the price go above fifty at that point. I would yeah. imagine probably, maybe maybe not. Maybe it goes at forty eight because we talked about that number being significant. But like, it's gonna start to it's gonna start to get uh, unpredictable, even more unpredictable than it already is, um, because we have. The, the institutions are, are here. Like, they're yeah. here. Uh, the front-running of them will end. We will no longer be... We will no longer be able to say that we are front-running institutions. Right. Now we are competing with institutions. So the front-running will be ending in two weeks. Right? If you want to say you front-ran front BlackRock, if you front-run uh, Fidelity and VanEck and, and all the big players and the smartest guys in the money space, if you want to be able to say that, you got to buy something in the next two weeks because... After that, you are competing with them. You are no longer front running. You are in a competition to get as much of the Bitcoin protocol as you possibly can with the amount of capital that you have and the amount that's going to be available. And and, and the front running days are, are going to be over. Yeah, that's that's important. I, I feel like we're going to have some melting faces price action in the in the next by summer of 2024. I think people's lives are going to be changing. Um, so just stay level-headed, stay optimistic. Don't compare your portfolios with anyone and just stick to your systematic plan and things will work out, man. Just make sure you take profits because if, if you don't take profits, that's nothing's worse than round tripping your bags back down. So just, just have that plan, stick to your plan, stay disciplined and keep educating yourself, whether it's our podcast, someone else's podcast. There's so many great content out there. So give us a like, comment, subscribe. Let us know if you want us to discuss anything in our next podcast, and we look forward to talking with you. So don't, don't trust, trust verify. verify.